Welcome to the Governance Podcast from the Centre for the Study of Governance and Society here at King's College London. My name is Mark Pennington and I'm Director of the Centre. I'm very pleased to have with me today Irvin Decker. Irvin is Senior Research Fellow at the Mercatus Centre at George Mason University. As well as numerous articles, he's published two books, Jan Tinbergen and the Rise of Economic Expertise, and The Viennese Students of Civilization, both with Cambridge University Press. Today we're going to be talking about a new book he has edited with Pavel Kuchar, entitled Governing Markets as a Knowledge Commons, also with CUP. Irvin, it's very good to have you with us here today. Wonderful to be here, Mark. Thank you. Okay, so the focus of this book is an exploration, both in theory and in practice, of the institutional infrastructure that supports commercial exchange. And it uses the concept of knowledge commons to explain how that infrastructure is provided and sustained. I wonder if we could start off the conversation with you just saying a little bit about what led you to focus on exploring this infrastructure within which markets operate. Is it something that you think has been sort of under-researched up to this point? Um, Well, I think the governance of markets has received more and more attention, actually, in, say, the past decade or so. I think um, the literature on neoliberalism has historically sort of refocused our attention to the construction of markets, both internationally but also domestically. Um, And I think in the uh, work on economic history, the idea that institutions are important in creating economic growth or facilitating the spread of markets has been well recognized. Um, That's a little bit different from what came before, which might perhaps be under understood as a sort of market naturalism, where we feel that markets sort of arise whenever two people meet, they will start exchanging and we can start calling it a market from there on. But I don't think that economists nowadays have a very institution poor conception of markets. I do think that what we add to this debate is that if there is a kind of private governance of markets, um, right, where it's um, individual parties that set up the infrastructure or there's public governance of markets where a third party has to come in to legislate a market or to create the legal framework in which a right of property rights and everything like that to to make Mm. the market function. We say, well, we don't want to deny that both of these are are possibilities, but if we look at markets, how markets function, um, then we see a lot of uh, community or a kind of social governance of markets that happens both um, when groups of firms set up things or develop things, but it also happens frequently as a sort of unintended byproduct of repeated exchanges. Mm -hmm. Sometimes those um, structures get set up more deliberately and sometimes they emerge sort of as a side product of people exchanging in various ways. Okay, that's great. So what led you specifically to look at this idea of knowledge commons. Can you say a little bit more about that? Because I think that is quite a, a unique sort of interpretation in this in this sort of debate. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So, I mean, I guess it's, 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 it's in some sense a search for the right concept. So how do we make, of, make sense of this social governance? And um, knowledge commons is one way of doing that. Knowledge commons has um, a benefit and a drawback is that it actually Uh, has a sort of ambivalent meaning. So the knowledge commons also in the book refers to the pool of knowledge, Mm. um, right? So a a set of shared knowledge, say, within an academic discipline or amongst a set of producers about what the market is like and what the most likely uh, coming developments will be. So that's the pool of knowledge, right, that everybody draws on and that people exchange information about, that we debate also, right? Where where are we going to go in the next year? We don't know. But all of that is the pool. And then there's the governance question. Um, And commons also suggest that there is a kind of communal or social governance of the pool of knowledge. And I think um, analytically one could keep these two apart. um, But it's, it's almost inevitable that when you start talking about knowledge, in some sense, these two meanings get tangled up. Um, And what has happened um, in two edited volumes that came before us in the same series on the Knowledge Commons, is that uh, Brett Frischman and Mike Madison and Catherine Strandberg have really um, developed uh, 
um, and altered the framework um, that the Ostrom workshop developed mm -hmm. for institutional analysis and development to make it applicable to knowledge. Mm -hmm. And so what inspired us was that we drew on this, mm -hmm. this, um, this network or th this, this framework that they had um, adapted and thought, well, this can really work. And we take it in a slightly different direction than they take it because they, are, they come from mostly from law and from medicine. Um, right, and in medicine, there's of course a, a major debate over whether uh, the knowledge to create medicine should be uh, sort of open to yeah. society or whether it should be privately governed by big uh, pharma companies. And so, we said that that is true, and that's a very relevant debate about uh, about the importance of uh, IP and, and and all of the rest of it, but. If you look well at markets, you will easily see that there's a lot of other types of knowledge that are very important for the functioning. And that, that is when, when we return to what you described at the beginning, that these are market supporting infrastructures or yeah. shared pools of knowledge that facilitate market exchange, right? That allow yeah. us to, as um, me and my co-author have expressed it in one other paper, to agree on more than price, mm -hmm. right? So there's a kind of shared knowledge that's actually required to make exchanges work that goes far beyond price. And, and that's sort of what we uh, analyze. So just to go into that a little bit more, so is this, this is not directly about, or maybe it's partly about the knowledge that's actually communicated within a market. It's, you're actually referring to the knowledge about the, the institutional structures that actually create those markets in part. And I guess those are not mutually exclusive. The knowledge that's communicated within a market can't completely be separated from the knowledge about the way the market is actually structured or governed. Yeah. Is, that, is that the right way of thinking about this? Yeah, yeah that, that's a very helpful way of thinking about it. So sometimes we refer to it as the sort of informal rules of proper conduct. So yeah. what, uh, And that might entail what can and cannot be exchanged on markets, yeah. but it also entails what um, employers expect of their employee mm. Right. Um, we all know that there's a, a, a big literature on incomplete contracts, right? And you could think of, of knowledge commons as facilitating what um, those in, incomplete contracts uh, leave unspecified. So mm -hmm. I think it, in that way, it's also quite directly related to how people think about the importance of trust on markets, right? Mm -hmm. If there is a shared knowledge, there's a shared set, set of expectations and that facilitates market exchanges. You could conceptualize that as trust, and, and we, we uh, point the attention a bit more toward uh, the shared knowledge. And um, that's in part because we're also interested, and uh, especially my, my co-editor, Pavel Kutcher, has been very good in, in constantly asking this question. So how, where do markets come from? Like, what is it that makes them come about, right? And then you cannot rely simply on preconceived notions of trust or so, or the trust was already there. but. Right, then there needs to be an act of entrepreneurship in order to uh, create um, either a new, a new good and all the rules that come with it or um, a kind of redefinition of what we previously believed not to be tradable or previously believed. I, I was going to say on that, so you actually need, in a sense, to, before you can have a market, you need to have some sense that something might actually be exchanged. Yeah. People actually have to conceptualize this as possible. Yeah. Yeah, and those debates continue on, right? So even about work, right? There's is, is, is long debates within within economics about precisely what you can sell when you engage in a labor contract, and at what point that becomes slavery, and at mm -hmm. what point that becomes exploitative, um, right? Mm -hmm. And so it, it relates to that. But his work, for instance, has also looked at the emergence of the market for surrogate mo surrogate motherhood, mm -hmm. right? And and that's a wonderful example because there before the uh, changed meanings and the changed interpretation of markets, a lot of people treated the practice of surrogate motherhood as a version of baby selling. Mm. And nobody mm. or hardly anybody in society is probably in favor of baby selling. Mm. So what the entrepreneurs needed to do, and including the lawmakers, was they needed to reconceptualize even the concept of motherhood, mm -hmm. which interestingly enough in most law books is not specified because it's uh, yeah. completely uh, a sort of shared concept that we... Um, Take for, granted. take for granted, right? And um, then the reconceptualization suggests that, that what surrogate mothers who, uh, surrogate mothers do is they rent their womb out or that they provide a service mm -hmm. to the other person. And this is in part about right, the extent to which 
parts of your body can be alienated and can be donated to somebody else. Mm -hmm. uh, it is about um, what it means when a baby is born. Does that mean that uh, it is the, the mm -hmm. child of the mother who gave birth to it? Or could that mean that yeah. the child always belonged to this other couple and was only in temporary possession or something of the sort, right? So you have to define a lot of the, the, the concepts before uh, this market can function at all. Um, yeah, so it's a case where I guess it's, you know, the the extent of the market isn't isn't sort of just determined by um, some sort of basic features of things. It's actually about the way people conceptualize things. Yeah. That's the, that's the yeah, and it intersects with technology uh, yeah. very often, right? Before in vitro fertilization, probably nobody uh, had really thought of this then. Right, you have a different conceptualization. You might adopt a child, mm. but that's a very different concept. Mm. Uh, but now, because of the technological change, right, that uh, mm -hmm. yeah, then generates a new new meanings. But I myself have done a lot of work in cultural economics, yeah. right, and for um, works of art, mm. it is very often contested to what extent they can be mm. precisely uh, traded, and even if you own them, it's not perfectly obvious what one can do with it. A very famous instance is of a Japanese art collector who wanted to take a Van Gogh painting with him into the grave. Um, and this created a, a major outrage. Now, normally, if you own something, it's not a problem at all if you take it with you in, in, yeah. in, in your coffin. Right? That's, that's the wish, and <laughs> the, the children might object that the piece of jewelry <laughs> should be given to them, but um, right, it's, it's, it's a perfectly legitimate use of your own property. But apparently, Part of this artwork, because it was a Van Gogh, uh, and 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 it it was believed to be part of the art canon, or in some sense still part of the public domain, it was um, considered illegitimate, and ultimately um, the art collector was barred from taking it, uh, mm -hmm. taking the painting, uh, Doctor Gachet, into his grave. So there you see, um, yeah, in the art world you see lots of these exchanges about uh, or contested exchanges yeah. about what can and cannot be traded. But I, I think it'd be important to emphasize, wouldn't it, that this is not, when you talk about the role of technology there, it's not a sort of deterministic type no. view here where the technology sort of um, leads you automatically towards a market. It's more that the technology creates the possibility that there could be a market that then people may or may not sort of take advantage of yeah. through these changing cultural sort of constructions that they put on things. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's not technological determinism at yeah. all. It's in fact the, the culture that mediates what what, what sort of products then come out of yeah. that. Um, yeah. Okay, great. So, I mean, you mentioned in the, your earlier remarks um, Ellen Ostrom and some of her, her ideas relating to this. And I certainly, reading the book, I felt there were a lot of parallels. If you think about her work on natural resource commons, sort of attacks the idea that the only way that you can address um, various collective action or common pool problems is either to privatize the asset to create some kind of private ownership right, or to have an external state agency uh, manage the asset. And she's arguing that actually, no, there are lots of these bottom-up governance mechanisms. Likewise, you seem to be saying in the context of um, these forms of market governance that the market is natural, which I guess would be analog to the, the privatization case, but equally the governance structure within which the market operates it isn't necessarily provided by what we could think of as public authority or the state. And there are those these kind of bottom-up, but also sometimes hybrid structures. So could you say a little bit more about how this argument about knowledge commons relates to the sort of Ostrom arguments about natural resource commons? Yeah, the way we frame it in, in the preface of the book is that on a, I think, basic conceptual level, Ostrom... Uh, Ostrom's work suggests that there's a lot more cooperation mm -hmm. um, than on, uh, rather than just competition. Yeah. Um, and so that cooperation often is indeed aimed at collective action problems. Um, but I think in most real world problems, the collective action problems and the private action problems, if, if, if you want to put it that way, are very much entangled, right? Mm -hmm. And the development of a market. In fact, we, we quote her sort of... Um, saying that uh, the market itself is a public good mm -hmm. and we use that as a sort of starting point because I think yeah. her own way of thinking would actually run against the idea that the market itself in, in the mm -hmm. sense of the, the, the sort of institutional infrastructure itself is a public good. And so 
yeah, our work is is in, very much inspired by that way of thinking and um, inspired by the idea that um, where you see competition, you often also see forms of uh, cooperation. So um, this might be a bit of a, a silly example, but I was always fascinated uh, when I worked in industry that there was a Friday afternoon drinks. Uh, and, and just on my way in here, I walk through the financial district and um, right, all these people work in separate office buildings. But um, if you would look well and if you would do anthropological work, you would see that there's an enormous amount of exchange that goes on between these people. They share uh, intimate knowledge about uh, career planning with each other, despite the fact that on paper they would be competitors. They share extensive knowledge about what's going on in their firm, uh, perhaps of a kind that in a different setting would be called sort of uh, um, industrial espionage or, or something yeah. of the sort. Yeah. But there's also, and that is what some of the chapters in the book show, actually deliberate institutions that are being set up by firms in the same industry in order to exchange knowledge and to, to govern that communally. And I think all of those are wonderful examples of where if you look at how markets actually function rather than rely on a sort of textbook idea that the firms are competing or that individuals are competing with each other, we see a lot more forms of cooperation. And mm. yeah, I think one thing that follows from that for us, but I think that's something that we should explore more even in future work, is that this cooperation is actually essential to make to make it happen because otherwise you have individual exchanges. But in order to actually get the institutional structure that, that may turn something into a market that can spread and that other people can imitate, um, a lot more is, is, is required, including uh, solving some collective action problems. Well, when I, when I was reading those sections, I, mean, I was very much thinking that, in a sense, it, it just doesn't, if you think in these terms, it doesn't make sense to separate out cooperation from competition, because essentially what's happening in these cases is that people are cooperating to compete on another dimension. Yeah. So if they haven't had these kind of networks where they can share information and knowledge over a drink or whatever it might be, they wouldn't actually be in a position to compete on some other level. So it actually makes sense as part of a competitive strategy, if you think of it in those terms, to be involved in these networks. Even if, I guess, I suppose if you took an evolutionary view, even if people didn't actually know that that's what they were doing, uh, that would be the kind of effect that it might have. Is that a fair way of thinking about it? Yeah. Yeah, and I think the the not being aware of solving the collective action mm -hmm. problem, I think, is a very important part of it. So mm -hmm. um, some of the chapters in the book certainly do look at um, um, deliberate institutional arrangements to share knowledge mm -hmm. um, that also become solidified and institutionalized in various ways. But one of the chapters that, that I like very much discusses how creative cities work and why young creative workers are so incredibly attracted to cities, right? And willing to pay an enormous premium to live yeah. uh, to live there. And so that suggests that there must be some kind of value that they're getting from it, right? Mm -hmm. Now, that could be purely in the social sphere, right? There's mm -hmm. uh, Richard Florida's famous argument that people like to, be, like to live close to theaters and nightclubs mm -hmm. that allow them to be themselves. As, that's undoubtedly correct. But I think there's also something in which uh, a, a, f a form of cooperation which this chap chapter tries to capture to uh, it uses sort of big data methodology to figure out what people are talking about when they're meeting each other in these creative cities and yeah the argument from that th that follows from that is that the city itself in some sense is a form of cooperation mm -hmm. in which a whole lot of matching is going on but also a whole lot of cooperation is, is, is going on and without which markets couldn't exist so I think the the people being in, in, in the same place, right? They're generating a lot of things, which they might do out of purely selfish motives, mm -hmm. right? To get ahead, to start a mm -hmm. career, to get a more interesting job. But that as a side effect has the effect that, right? They create networks and those networks themselves um, become very val valuable foundations for a market. Um, one other way of thinking about this is, uh, I think uh, Jason Potts has done that wonderfully in his book on the innovation commons. He says, well, if we look at a lot of technological innovations, he says, we actually find small communities of amateurs experimenting with each other, playing almost. Uh, and then all of a sudden they stumble upon something. And that might be a moment in which one of the people that is part of this community steps out and starts to become an entrepreneur. So he talks about uh, the, the origins, origins of Silicon Valley in this way as essentially amateurs playing around with computers and playing around with 
with software that they were mostly sharing amongst each other, but then unbeknownst to them, in some sense, right, it, it kick-started um, yeah. this enormous market, which we now know. Well, we, we, I think we, we can come back to this a little bit later on, but it's, it's a good opportunity for me to, to, to pose this question about, about what you just said there, which is that, I mean, if you take the example of like a, a creative city um, as exhibiting these sort of properties, then a lot of it seems to take place by accident. People really don't know what's going on, and these things just happen to arise. Um, what are the sort of policy implications that flow from that? Do we just have to sort of make room for accidents to happen, or is there anything that policymakers can do, knowing that this is the, the kind of process that operates here, to sort of facilitate it, or, or at least not to stop it from happening? Or can they can they plan it in any sense? What what does it imply for, for the role of policy in this, in this area? I think that's a very good question. I, I think your Hayekian phrase, right, um, maximizing the opportunity for accidents to happen is, is, is one way of looking at it. Um, but I'm I'm here again a little bit inspired by what Jason Potts also writes in his book, and he says, well, policymakers are going to make policy, and um, letting accidents happen is probably not what they can describe as policy. Mm. So one instance in in or one example in in relation to creative cities is a turn towards uh, what is sometimes called placemaking, mm. um, and placemaking is essentially setting up. Um, um, spaces where people can rent an office, but there are also a lot of shared amenities, right? So they're in some sense forced to use the same kitchen or um, they're uh, stimulated to exchange information every now and then at, at certain occasions, right? And I think, uh, at least thinking in that way, you realize that what is important in uh, generating innovations or generating new types of activities or perhaps possibly even new markets, is that we need um, things that allow for the, the making of connections between different people. And I think that just changes from a focus on particular firms or particular industries to thinking about connections. Mm. And I think that's still very much on the conceptual level. And I don't think our book mm. already offers very detailed policy mm. suggestions. But I think even shifting the way we think about what's really valuable in the economy away from, say, ideas um, toward uh, connections or away from particular individuals to uh, particular places that allow for interaction yep. would already be a, a big step forward, I think. Well, it's, it's actually interesting you say that because I, I don't know whether you're aware, but certainly in this country at the moment, in, in the UK, there's the government has this focus on this, uh, what's, what it calls a levelling up agenda, uh, which is really about um, those parts of the country which are significantly perceived at any rate to be behind the southeast on the London area in the economic performance terms, you know, what can be done to actually raise the standard? And they're not looking at um, sort of traditional industrial or regional policies, it seems. A lot of the discussion has been around how you facilitate connections within these areas that actually places that are often quite close together have got very little movement between them. Um, so that people aren't interacting. So just listening to what you were saying about that, it, it, it sounded very much in, in tune with that sort of notion that actually facilitating the connections rather than actually predetermining an outcome, you know, is, is maybe the way to think about some of this. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think uh, right, if you think about connections, you immediately start to think about movements. And of course, a, a, a big part of movements is allowing for people to move. Mm -hmm. um, right, and I think internationally mm -hmm. that's important, but also nationally that might be very important. Mm -hmm. And I think in some sense, right, I don't think this is always ex expressed this way, but the worry about gentrification, mm -hmm. um, right, would in this sense be quite real, because if a certain class of people is pushed out of the city, it's mm -hmm. in some sense also denied the connections to these very valuable networks. Mm -hmm. And so you might think that there is a real question also about equity. Uh, in, in who gets to live in the city or who can afford yeah. uh, to live in the city. Um, obviously, a very, another very important moment of making connections is education, right? So I mm -hmm. think it would also make you look at education somewhat differently in the sense that yeah. it's very much about making connections uh, yeah. rather than only about mm -hmm. acquiring knowledge so that you mm -hmm. yourself develop human capital, which mm -hmm. you can then later, I don't know, turn into 
uh, and how they are a valuable product. Skills of negotiating with other people or yeah. being in a setting where there are other people. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes I describe cities as just major matching markets, right? Mm -hmm. you're, you're, um, there's there's a lot of individuals and they're trying to to match. They're they're trying to, right? They do that, of course, in in, in terms of relationships and in yeah. finding a partner. But they also do that in in terms of finding other people with like like-minded interests and. Those like-minded interests might turn into right shared practices, and those shared practices might eventually give rise to right commercial ventures or markets or something of the sort. So um, there's an interesting chapter in the in the book by um, Martin Ricketts and Terence Keel, who we've actually had come here to to pr present to our group, where they talk about the importance of what they call contribution goods in the context of um, sort of scientific knowledge which they claim underpin the Industrial Revolution. So they're basically saying that arguments around the notion that knowledge is a sort of quasi-public good that people will want to keep private, um, because if they reveal knowledge that they've secured, somehow other people can free ride off it. They, they argue that that's the wrong way of thinking about it. Can you say a little bit more about what they mean by this notion of a contribution good and, and how it relates to, um, to those kind of questions? Yeah, so I think that they have they have a wonderful chapter um, which discusses. Um, I wouldn't necessarily call it scientific knowledge mm. because I think a lot of the um, arguments in the book are in fact about a kind of practical know-how. Yeah, um, and yeah. a lot of the knowledge comments that exist around around markets, I don't think, are necessarily so much scientific mm. knowledge as they are um, almost a trade knowledge and knowledge about, about right. Indeed, knowing how to make make exchanges, knowing how to make connections. And so it's a kind of more, more practically oriented uh, knowledge. One other good example that Rene Prendergast, I think, has in the book is that crafts have developed very much in this way, right, in, in transmitting sort of practical know-how from a master to an apprentice uh, and the like. But, but to get back to what they're saying is that they're saying that um, what was unique about this period uh, especially in England, was that a lot of societies came about um, which facilitated the exchange of knowledge, often including both scientists as well as entrepreneurs, and they uh, contributed. And this notion of the contribution, we think, is, is of pivotal importance to understand how knowledge commons function. Because in some sense, right, it is a, a genuine collective action problem, um, and that means that the, the problem lies in the fact that nobody ha would have a private incentive to contribute because making the contribution is costly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so you, we somehow have to um, find a way to incentivize people to want to contribute. Um, now, again, my thinking here is a bit inspired by cultural scenes, uh, mm -hmm. right? A lively cultural scene makes people want to be part of that scene. Mm -hmm. Well, in order to be part of a scene, you often have to be something of an artist yourself or something yeah. of a creator yourself. You have to have something to offer, otherwise you will be excluded from the party, so to mm. say. Yeah. And I think they make the same argument there for uh, scientific clubs or these uh, book clubs or learn, learn men club at the time, learn men clubs at the time is that membership is sort of dependent on you being an interesting conversation partner mm. or you having something to add or you doing some experiments at home about which you can tell. Mm. Right? So in some sense, you have to become a practitioner. Mm. They develop that even into the idea that knowledge has to be activated. So sometimes the economists like to think about knowledge as a public good. Well, it's written down in books, so everybody mm. has access to it. But I think a good look at actual scientific practice means that you have to engage with it quite often and often in conversation with others to really understand what's, what's in those books and why that is of value and why that's of relevance. So I think they do a really good job at describing that. And I think one of the key points in their theory is that there needs to be something of a critical mass. Mm. Because if there's a critical mass of other people contributing, it becomes interesting enough for you to also join the group. Yep. That means that there's a kind of initial the f a first mover problem, mm. like who sets up the first pool. And mm. so that might be a genuine collective action problem, might even be, be undersupplied. I don't know. That, that we would have to analyze in specific instances. But it's not obvious that it would get off the ground because the first three people are basically putting in too much work and the, the, the 10 to the 20th person that comes in gets to benefit from what the, the first 10 have already developed while making only marginal additional mm -hmm. contributions. But once it's off the ground, I think it explains very well why people would want to continue contributing to that mm -hmm. as long as it's lively and as long as other people are 
continuing to contribute. One of the other chapters actually develops this notion of willingness to contribute next to willingness to pay. So they mm -hmm. say that uh, willingness to pay is how markets uh, function, whereas how knowledge pools function and sometimes also other types of cultural activities is, is by generating a willingness to contribute. Yeah, I mean, I, really, I very much enjoyed that, that chapter. It sort of opened my eyes to certain things. I mean, effectively, they were saying that you, you have to be contributing before you're even in a position to talk about free riding, in which case there isn't a free rider problem in the way that people yeah. traditionally talk about it, except, as you say, in the initial sense that there needs to be this critical number of people involved in a field in the first place, which I think they describe more as a sort of coordination problem where you need to get enough people... You know, in the same way that enough people have to drive on the right or the left-hand side of the road for it to make, make sense for others to do the same. You need a similar sort of process happening here. That's the way I read what they were saying about that. Yeah, yeah. But I think, I mean, if you think about, right, go back to the creative city, I think that on some meso level, the different industries are competing with each other yeah. for talent. And you would like, of course, the most talented people to yeah, contribute to, to, to whatever different. practice you have going on. So, th so there is competition between these knowledge clubs, if you will, or between these, these social practices to attract interesting uh, uh, young talents to, to, to join them. So, yeah. so in what way, I mean, you, you mentioned it, you know, at the beginning of the conversation that, um, you know, it's a bit of a caricature these days, perhaps to say that economists don't take into account the institutions within which markets function. How would you say that the way they understand the role of those institutions is different to the kind of emphasis that you're placing in it in terms of how you understand the institutions? I mean, you are emphasizing very much um, essentially these kind of cultural phenomena within which markets are embedded. Um, can you say a bit more about why you think that is, is very distinct? And I think it is very distinct from, from the way, you know, even the more institutionally sensitive economists understand what institutions actually do. Yeah. Well, I think um, the, still the, the standard view of institutions is that they are in some sense external constraints, so they're very important to the function of the market, but they have an origin outside of the market and they operate as, as a kind of external constraint. Um, in the same way that we might be constrained in a cer certain resource or um, or something of the sort. And I think what our perspective suggests, right, is that institutional rules are endogenous outcomes, right? They are endogenously generated. So I think uh, I have worked on, on the Austrian School of Economics before, but if you, I think, look back at how uh, Karl Menger talks about the evolution of money, he talks about that as an endogenous evolution of different types of money that grow alongside markets and that allow for different types of exchanges. And I think that process is ongoing, right? Uh, the euro is only 20 years old, which was meant to um, be a new stage of money because the national monies in some sense felt as uh, a genuine constraint on um, inter-country trade within the European continent. And now we see with cryptocurrencies, we uh, find again new ways of money that are seem specifically geared toward um, facilitating digital exchanges, right? That might be of a global nature and that might be um, quite anonymous compared to uh, money changing hands beforehand, right? Where cash was uh, a wonderful thing to have, right? You see it, you can touch it, and it facilitates interpersonal exchange, but that's of course not how the digital economy works at all, right? you're typically thousands of miles away from the person that you're trading with. So you need a different type of money to facilitate that exchange. And I think that evolution you can see in, in many other types of institutions. And we try to pinpoint them and it might be occasionally a bit vague. And I think we're still very much looking for, um, so what are the other um, key areas? But um, right, just on a basic level, Menger was interested in the evolution of language and uh, coming up with language concepts um, justifications for certain practices is is very much is very much part of that uh, part of that process, um, but it might develop much more. I think the the way we have now developed very sophisticated techno te technologies alongside with institutions for sharing that knowledge 
or sometimes restricting access to that knowledge mm -hmm. because that's something we haven't talked about. But yeah. um, right, that sort of governance has very much emerged alongside markets, and it's still constantly being challenged. Right. So I mentioned IP before, but uh, if you think about intellectual property and in relation to say music or movies over the past 20, 30 years, we see that that has evolved enormously and all of those institutions have, have, have had to evolve alongside these markets and they, and they make new, new markets such as uh, currently streaming platforms possible. So on, on the point about restriction there, I mean this is a question I was going to ask which is that when you speak about a lot of these arrangements for cooperation and sharing, a lot of people would see those and you do sometimes see this in the discussion about cryptocurrencies as sort of conspiracy theories. It's sort of an attempt to restrict competition in certain ways because people are doing these sort of deals amongst themselves. Um, is that just because people have a faulty understanding of the way competition works in these contexts? You know, they've not recognized that cooperation is part of competition to go up to what go back to what we were saying before. Or are there genuinely issues in these areas where some of these sort of knowledge sharing activities can also lead to sort of cartelistic behavior that, that blocks markets and makes them quite exclusive in certain situations? No, no I think the, the, the worry about um, cartel-like uh, problems are, are very, very real. I think one of the, one of the best applied chapters in, 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 in the book is by Michel um, Vetris, and it talks about um, the emergence of the market for single malt scotch whiskey. Mm. Um, yeah. So now this was, uh, despite what they will have to, you make believe that this was already done in the 18th century in this way, is actually a quite recent invention, um, that this was the, the proper way to do it, which uh, comes from a, a single type of grain, I believe, and, and um, has other restrictions to it. And this was a kind of new exclusive market category that was developed by one of the market leaders, but ultimately in cooperation with other mm -hmm. Scotch producers, right? And it became um, mm -hmm. a very successful market category um, that for which consumers, they have accepted it, right? They are yeah. willing to pay a premium mm -hmm. for this type of product. And they will, of course, say that it's partly about the taste. But yeah. um, I think uh, if, if you analyze status markets well, you understand that sometimes mm -hmm. you're also buying into status. So that, that that's undoubtedly part of what um, people are willing to pay for here. So they succeeded very well, but um, in generating a, a shared knowledge pool, in having consumers be willing to believe in it, so in, in some sense it was a convincing um, proposition, it was a successful knowledge commons, and then um, they started protecting the scotch industry um, because producers in both Australia and Japan and other countries uh, sought to imitate it. They also wanted to sell single malt scotch. They were excluded from doing so, so they were denied access to the market category. Um, the Scotch industry sought to team up with um, legislators in order to uh, effectively protect their market, mm. uh, right? And even though, uh, and and then I think the dynamic is interesting because in some sense it's just a it just becomes a classic rent-seeking story, um, which I think economists can analyze really well. But I would again point us to the social side of the the issue, and that is why do consumers keep believing that single malt scotch is the thing they should buy, um, even though blind taste tests and whiskey magazines unanim unanimously agree that um, um, Japanese whiskey or Japanese scotch is just as good, and perhaps they won't, right? And then um, yeah. the previous understanding of what this product is and what its essential properties are will be altered and it will much more refer to perhaps the production process rather than the location. It might refer more to taste um, mm. rather than to uh, the way it was produced. And we'll see how that develops. But I think it's important to see there that part of why it works as a rent-seeking mm. gig is not merely a legislative question, but it's also a cultural story mm. about why consumers want to buy only scotch. Uh, or want to buy only French wines, or want to mm. buy only right Italian oh, I was going to say, olive oil. Champagne is another yeah. example of this, isn't yeah. it? I mean, there yeah. are multiple examples of it. Yeah, uh, and actually other products. But that, I mean, that's an interesting point, isn't it? Because you're talking here about very much in this whole discussion about markets as as cultural phenomena, and in one sense, um, you know, one might want to take a sort of cosmopolitan view that. Um, you know, and you have multiple sort of cultures interacting. 
But at the same time, there seems to be, and I certainly perceive this in the world at the moment, a push towards a kind of cultural protectionism as well, where people want to preserve what they see as the Scottish whiskey or the champagne or whatever it is. And, that, and this is now happening on multiple dimensions. And it gets wrapped in with all kinds of other arguments. How, how do you explain that sort of phenomenon? I mean, is it part of this process of, you know, addressing what might be a, a collective action problem? Or is it some evidence that people seem to have a need for a sort of attachment to particular places or brands or whatever it might be that just seems to arise wherever wherever markets happen, that people do form these attachments that are actually not that easy then to break down? Um, well, I mean, it, it, it's a very good question and one that in some sense I think is far beyond the scope of what I, I fully know, but I think this does allow us to speculate, right? I think we suggest that markets are culturally grounded. Um, so even if the products are sold, world, sold worldwide, um, the production uh, process and the, the knowledge commons associated with that might be quite local, um, say in a global film industry such as Hollywood, which then still in its, yeah, yeah, in its protection is, or in its production phase is, is very local and um, um, concentrated. But it is indeed also true that consumers seem to be, uh, I would even say, more and more interested in not buying a, 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 an, an anonymous commodity, but in buying a product that is tied to a particular uh, time and place. Uh, I, th I think you see this much more broadly. Um, so there's uh, also talk of the, the new craft industry. So if you think mm. about what happened to the craft beer revolution or mm. even to the way barbershops look, right? They're trying to recreate yeah. an authentic barbershop yeah. feeling that they locate somewhere in the past about uh, um, about a real grooming experience that, that, that one might have in there. Um, you see it with um, the rise of uh, modern cuisine or a sort of a, a, a desire for authenticity of various cuisines around the world. Mm. Um, and I think in part that shows that um, consumers are motivated by identity concerns and that they're buying into the meaning and the story of the product as much as they are buying into sort of the functional, uh, functional specifics of a particular product. And I think our books has something to say about that because I think um, whereas the production might rely on a shared knowledge commons between the producers, I think in order to get the um, consumers interested in the product, there also needs to be a kind of culture of appreciation. So people that understand the meanings that are attached to it. Mm -hmm. And this is not at all obvious, right? Um, mm -hmm. um, yeah, my, my former supervisor always told the example about the 200 uh, dollar pair of scissors that um, you could buy in Japan because it was produced according to traditional craft methods. And now, of course, we can talk about the functional specifics of this pair of scissors and say, well, it's much sharper, it lasts longer or whatever, but probably we're not going to quite um, be able to uh, explain why it's uh, 40 times more expensive than a pair, pair of scissors that you might buy around the corner. Uh, so what you're in part buying into is the story and that story has to be told and shared and believed in, that it has to be bought into almost. And um, when people buy that, right, they, they might also feel that they're contributing to keeping a kind of practice and culture alive, right? Yeah. So they're buying a craft product and thinking that yeah. in part the transaction is not merely the willingness to pay for it, for, but it's actually a form of a contribution. And this might get much more active, right? There's a, a f famous analysis of say fan cultures uh, and, and fan fiction right, uh, consumers that actually start producing and adding to the product or that come up with new ways of using the product that has been produced by others. And so there it's very obvious that they're adding something, but I think even the act of purchase and the fact that they're doing that locally or that they're supporting somebody who produces it in a sort of authentic manner, they understand in part as a, con as a contribution rather than merely a payment. No, I think, I think that's interesting. I think the, the reason I asked the question, and it, maybe it's unfair because it's for me to, to ask you this because it's not really the topic of your book, but it, it's just something that fascinates me at the moment, which is that, I mean, if you think of this from a sort of um, Austrian economics type point of view, a lot of people within that tradition emphasize the value of sort of creative destruction within markets, 
um, if you think on, on economic dimensions, the value that is, that's placed on that. You're talking about uh, cultural phenomena here and the fact that markets are always embedded in cultures. But it seems if we look around the world at the moment, people don't like cultural creative destruction. Um, and I, I, I personally like create cultural creative destruction. I think it's a good thing. Yeah. But a lot of people seem to think it isn't. Yeah. And it fascinates me why, why is that? Um, you know, I, I don't quite understand it myself. And it's something that I'm just looking for others to tell me what's going on in the world. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's um, my, I, I worked in a field that we always called cultural economics. And a natural out, outgrowth of that is the idea that we're going to have a cultural economy that's value-driven and, and, yeah. and the like. But I must say that what's currently happening, I think, is that we're seeing a value-driven economy. I think a prominent example that we've seen recently is a lot of companies um, withdrew from the Russian market yeah. uh, to express a, a value um, that they believe that most of their customers share, namely that Russia's war in uh, Ukraine or Russian invasion is illegal or morally wrong. And so these companies are expressing that value. And I do think that this actually runs against what a lot of people, including myself, find most attractive about markets that we don't have to agree on everything yeah. in order to still exchange, a, yeah. a, a, engage in exchanges. But I think right, these are in some sense two different, uh, different discussions. On the one hand, we can just observe how markets work, which we attempt to do in the book, and then we see that markets actually function better or in some sense depend on agreeing more. But how extensive that agreement should be or it's desirable to have agreement to, to a very large extent um, is not so obvious. Um, a lot of the authentic things that are currently being sold are also, right, like I said, quite recent inventions. So they're in fact yeah. uh, uh, innovations rather than traditions. Mm -hmm. Um, so in some sense, they might satisfy your desire for having a kind of cultural creative destruction because people are, are rediscovering or reimagining what the 19th century cuisine is somewhere looked like and they're putting on their 21st uh, century version of that and we all get to enjoy it, um, which in some sense you might also call a for form of cultural exchange. Uh, yep. But yeah. Okay, I just had to ask that question. So. Um, all right, well, I wonder if we could move on to just, I've sort of hinted at this a little bit um, earlier on in the conversation. I wonder if we just try and connect maybe some of the themes in, in this, this book on knowledge commons um, to some of your earlier work. So you have this, I think it's a wonderful book on the um, Viennese students of civilization. And, you know, you address a range of thinkers there, most of whom I guess we would say are within what's sometimes called the Austrian tradition, but not exclusively so. And the theme that comes out from that book is that this, were, this was a group of people who saw the role of social science not to be one of sort of generating social engineering type solutions to social problems, but a much more sort of modest or uh, a very modest task of just trying to understand essentially what kind of social processes operate. And you can interpret that in some ways as being quite I mean, some people, I guess, would say it's quite a um, a negative or a, or a conservative vision in the sense that you're you're not putting forward grand proposals for how society should be reformulated. You're just sort of saying, you know, you have to accept that these kind of processes unfold. We don't know a lot about them. We can only know about them in very broad outline, and that's pretty well it. Um, I wonder if you could sort of reflect on on how that vision connects, if it does at all, to what you're saying in this book. I mean, I guess it goes back to the point I was making earlier about, is there anything policy can do to facilitate uh, the emergence of the kind of structures that you've been talking about here that, that, that govern markets effectively? Yeah. Um, so I do think there are connections, but there's also an important difference. I think um, what I emphasize in that book, um, and I do that through the notion of student, um, yeah. but I argue that um, the students even had almost a pre-modern sensibility in the sense that they wandered at the world or marveled mm -hmm. at the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, that indeed can sound very conservative in the way that you pointed out. So um, I myself grew a little bit impatient with it in some sense because it allows almost for 
uh, no change, not even um, quite clearly social change, although the second half of the book does try to argue how they reconceive their own role more as a sort of the vendor or guardian of certain cultural traditions. But what I've I've done in more recent work is ex extend their that sensibility into the idea of uh, an emancipatory role um, for uh, students of society. I think this is very obvious or very clear in, in the work of Eleanor Ostrom, if you read it, mm -hmm. is that you can work with communities to help them solve their own problems. Um, and that is an emancipatory role in the sense that, right, these are genuine problems that they're struggling with. And it's the community itself or the society that comes up with solutions um, to its own problems. And in some part, that's that can simply be studied, which is what a lot of her work did. But she wasn't content to merely study it and say, mm. well, sometimes we also encounter situations that are genuinely dysfunctional and mm. are perceived by the people we study as dysfunctional. So we have to work with them in order to improve them. And that working with them, I think, is, is a very important difference, which um, I am trying to explore in, in, in a sort of philosophy of science manner. So how does that differ? What type of different attitude does that require? What type of even different methodology, because I think it re requires a lot of um, sensitivity to the subjectiveness of problems, mm -hmm. because I think a lot of social science proceeds from external problem definitions, right? Mm -hmm. We stand outside and we say, oh, uh, uh, populism is on the rise. That's yeah. a problem, and yeah. therefore we have to do something about it, rather than, uh, right, populism is on the rise means that there is a subjective experience somewhere of people yeah. either favoring populism or being very set, fed up with the status quo and finding something very wrong mm -hmm. with the status quo and then opting for a different set of political leaders, right? So it requires working with communities to solve their own problems must really be that we're working with their problem definitions and not problem definitions that mm. uh, arise somehow from our own academic concerns or something of the sort. But then I do think that there is a role for some of this knowledge to emancipate others. It's also, it might become a bit more uh, casuistic in the sense that, right, we, we look at how knowledge commons operate in different markets and uh, it's, it's a kind of practical endeavor. Um, and practical problems are very various and heterogeneous, uh, heterogeneous, but there can certainly be learning between different sorts of practices and what, may, what makes some of them stale and how we can revive them. Um, to give just one example, again, from sort of cultural policy, is that um, when they first started protect, protecting heritage, right, so, so yeah. after the, yeah. the stuff that we just talked about, they very much thought about heritage in terms of built heritage. So it was churches and monuments and other sort of things that you could touch and that um, clearly could be protected and restored and whatever else not. And um, I think now increasingly they realize that what they in fact should seek to keep alive is an engagement with this heritage. Um, so in classical music, this is, is very clear, right? You can preserve the original compositions as written down by, by Beethoven or Handel or mm -hmm. whoever else. But of course, what you need to keep the heritage alive is you need to keep re-performing it. And the performers don't quite agree whether we should, that, should do that in the most traditional way with um, a period instruments or whether we should do that in modern ways to draw new audiences in. But it does show that what is really of value here right, is, the, is the living heritage and not the built heritage in sort of stale buildings. And I think that that's another way in which um, uh, a policy could be improved or at least it, Right, this uh, thinking about social activity gives us a different, different angle on on um, on traditional questions of policy. I, I think I, I think what I was what I'm getting at is a sense that a lot of academics, in in, in my experience, and it, it's probably true of myself, is that they're not actually content to be students of civilization. Yeah. Yeah. They actually want to get involved in um, things in a way that actually ends up with them even if it's not always explicit, imposing their particular frame on questions. I'm not saying that happened uh, with, with someone like Ostrom, but arguably even people who do talk about, you know, these the sort of bottom-up processes um, sometimes can go in with a frame uh, yeah. about how something should be addressed. I mean, she herself was very keen. One of the things I like about her work is she talks about the importance of avoiding panacea traps. Yeah. 
And I guess it's how, if you're thinking about how this interact, this framework interacts with policy, how you can sort of get both academics or policymakers or whoever to, to recognise that there are no one size fits all sort of yeah. solutions to these some of these sorts of issues. Well, the world itself is, of, of course, always going to have different sensibilities in them, right? So, and there's always going to be a lot of people who want to solve problems. But I think one of the things I try to emphasize in the Students of Civilization book is that one of the major roles that they saw for themselves was to warn against mm -hmm. certain types uh, of solutions or certain ways of thinking. I think Ostrom's warning against panaceas is a good instance of that. Uh, the Austrian economists had, had a lot more, right, about uh, the dangers of trying to design um, large large scale solutions to, to problems. Uh, we can think about scale, right? Uh, yeah. Eleanor Ostrom's work is, is very good about scale. So it can lead to a bunch of cautionary tales. And I think one cautionary tale that would follow from the social governance of markets is that don't think that because there is no public governance, there is no governance at all, um, mm -hmm. right? And we do this all the time in political science. This is a very common idea is that if there's a failed state, there must be no governance at all, which is, is if you look well, not at all true, um, yeah. right? There is There are all types of forms of governance. You might not always like them, but mm -hmm. I mean, it's at least one very important cautionary tale is that there's all sorts of governance structures that have emerged to, go to govern these knowledge commons. And um, if we are going to improve something or build on them, we must first be able to recognize them and not think that they're they're not there simply because there is not yet a public agency that's concerned with it. Okay, so um, what's next for you, Irving? What's, what's, what's the next project uh, beyond this, this excellent book, which I strongly recommend everybody should read? Um, well, um, a bunch of things, but uh, the, f the first book that I'm currently working on um, talks about um, the realizing the values of art. And uh, it touches on uh, a number of the things that we implicitly discuss here, but um, I think the main point of that book is that traditionally when economists look at markets and value creation more generally, they look at the moment of transaction. This is best captured in our famous GDP measure, which is mm -hmm. essentially uh, adding up all the transactions that happen within a, a given calendar year and then saying that's the size of the economy. But it happens more generally because even when we don't want to do GDP, we look at the, the, the size of markets or we look at prices and we think that the moment of interaction itself is where the value is being generated or we, where we can read it off. Um, and we want to show that um, if we look well at the arts, we see that a lot of value is being generated even before things get to the market, because a lot of things don't get to the market. The, mm -hmm. the arts is for a very important part. An amateur endeavor uh, never reaches the market or only reaches the market, right? When uh, your friend sings in a choir and then gives one <laughs> performance a year, okay, for that one performance, you will buy a ticket and you will join him. But right, the most of the value that he gets out of it is in all the practice that he does throughout the year. And it's that, that activity itself that, that's the value. And then, uh, so that's before the transaction. And then after the transaction, there's a whole process in which cultural objects get what is sometimes called valorized. So they become meaningful or they're, um, people attribute meaning to them or they are contested, which is even more interesting. The value of them is contested. And all of that happens after the transaction, but is a very important process of, or for, very important part of the value process that we, uh, mm -hmm. we seek to lay out in that book. And then... Um, in line with my Viennese Students of Civilization book, I keep doing uh, history of economics. So um, one of the things that I'm, I'm working on at the moment is um, with my co-author Stefan Kolev, we want to look at uh, the German historical school, which is uh, yes. yep. uh, a very, very sort of institutionally and historically oriented school, um, more hated than loved, I think, uh, by nearly all uh, schools of uh, modern um, economics including the Austrians, mm -hmm. who famously clashed with them in, mm -hmm. in the Methodenstreit. Um, but we want to suggest that their version of historical institutionalism was um, actually quite important in shaping economics in the first part of the 20th century, and there might actually be a lot of um, interesting ways of framing uh, thinking about the economy in their work that have been sort of fallen by the wayside because they, they don't have a lot of friends in, in, in modern academia. So we... Uh, 
going to look at some of the, the working title is The Children and the Bastards of the, uh, the German Historical School. Oh, well, that's a wonderful title, and I, ca I can't think of a better note, actually, than which to, um, to, uh, to end the conversation. So thank you very much, Owen, for joining us today, and um, it's been, um, been very good to talk to you and hope to talk to you again in the future. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much, Mark. It was a pleasure. Thank you.